Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nisha Singh. Uh, I'm the facilitator for the Social Norms Working Group of Finequity. Welcome to the webinar, uh, Can Social Norms Theory Provide a Roadmap for Women's Financial Inclusion? Um, thank you so much for joining us on time and we will try and get started right away. Um, we have uh, a packed hour uh, and are joined by Ben Sislagi from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Sorry, uh, yeah, there I found the right slide. Um, ben has been, is an associate professor at LSHTM and has been working on social norms for a long time. And I've had the opportunity to read a lot of his work over the last couple of years and found it really useful in framing framing the, uh, the discussion around how social norms impact uh, women's financial inclusion and women's economic empowerment outcomes. So uh, we thought it would be a good start for this uh, e-discussion that kicks off today to start with what we can learn from the theory as well as you know, the work that has already been done in other communities. Um, we, ben will talk a little bit about his work, uh, some of the theoretical concepts and how they can inform practice. And then we'll have time along the way for questions as well. Um, just to get us started, I'm going to launch a quick poll for you to start. Um, so you should see it now. And if you could respond, I'll give you about 30 seconds. Okay, so majority of the people disagree that with the statement that we should not attempt to change social norms uh, because they are said to provide order to society. Okay, one more question very quickly. Uh, social norms are one of the most significant barriers to women's financial inclusion and you have four options. Okay, five more seconds if you want to register your opinion. Okay, um, so yes, and then yes, but, or yes, but, and then yes, those, that's the order of um, how this audience feels. Um, so that's really helpful in understanding um, your views on the role of social norms, in, specifically in the context of financial inclusion. I'm now going to hand it off to Ben uh, to uh, introduce himself and also um, share with his thoughts with us. So I'll stop sharing and Ben, you should be able to share your screen now. Thank you. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm really, glad to have this opportunity let's see if this works uh, you should be you should be seeing my screen is that right uh, with my powerpoint um, but i hope so <laughs> certainly hope so yes we do see it thanks so yeah as nisha says i work at the london school of hygiene and tropical medicine and i uh, even though this is a school of public health, I work in a center for gender equality and I also actively collaborate with, the, with Stanford University, where there is also, where the, the, the university is setting up a new center, a global center for gender equality, which is not active yet, but, but essentially we are looking at uh, social norms, not only, ex not exclusively, as they sustained um, health related or gender related health issues but but more generally how uh, social norms affect gender equality and i also have a little quiz for you but but we'll get that in a minute 
oh, I usually start with this disclaimer that essentially says, I, in my work, I, trend, I tend to focus on, on the, on, I tend to, to understand what the juice of, of the theory is. So I'm not going to overburden you with theory, but at the same time, if you want to, you know, you might think that sometimes I'm skipping over certain um, nomenclatures or certain jargon, and, and there are small differences in the theories. So we have a paper under review, but, but more generally, if there is any moment in which you want to ask whether one type of norm is called in a different way in the literature because you heard another name or anything like that, please feel free. But, but I will try to focus on the espresso rather than the milk foam of, of the theory, right? So on what actually people need to design effective interventions. And, and, and my interest in social norms kind of challenges this idea in, in international developments that is challenged more in the theory than in the practice that just give people new knowledge and they will enact new behaviors, uh, material resources aside. So the idea, for instance, that, you know, if you uh, include women in the labor force, uh, you could tell a husband, then your entire fa your family as a whole will, will improve. And, and this man might say, and this woman as well, they might say, yeah, well, okay, we understand the knowledge, but we just can't do it. Why can't they do it? That's the question. Well, one example comes from an intervention that I often mention, which is not ex explicitly related to financial inclusion, but, but it's a nice story. And um, it's more of an example than, than a detailed story. But this is the story of um, a, um, a studies, so a water disinfection uh, strategy in Bolivia. And Bolivia is a very hot place. And, you know, this is a rural village. So there are all these roofs and, and, and they found a very, very efficient and cost-effective system to disinfect water. So you can take tap water, you can put it in a plastic bottle, and then you put the plastic bottle on top of the, uh, of the roof. Uh, and then after eight hours, the water is drinkable. So after eight hours of exposure to, to the so solar light, uh, the water gets disinfected. So, however, when they research, in spite of an extensive campaign, they found, the researchers found that people knew about this, but they found very interesting that either everyone was complying with this practice in a given village, or almost no one, if, if not no one, was complying with the practice. So one hypothesis as to why, so you either, you didn't have moderate, like, um, it was moderating the larger population, but within villages they were clearly uh, clustered. And when they when they had to hypothesize, hypothesize why, one explanation, which seems to be supported by the data, is that nobody wanted to be the first one to put the water on the roof. Why? Because putting the water putting the water bottle on the roof signified I am the poorest in this community. I cannot afford water at the shop. Uh, so if everyone was doing it, then there was no shame, no stigma. People didn't anticipate any shame in doing it. But if they were the first one, they anticipate shame. So in your case, imagine that a family is trying to, um, is too poor and they need to send the, the, the wife to, to work in a, in, in, to generate revenue. Well, nobody might want to be the first household to do so because everyone might be afraid that, oh my God, I will be the first one to, to show that myself as a man alone, I'm not enough to provide for my family and everyone will judge me. Instead, if you have almost everyone already um, working outside of the household, then, then it will be fine. So this, is, this kind of framework is offered by social norms theory. And as I mentioned, there is many, many, uh, and, and, and I will tell you in what way, what that means. And, and there is many theories of social norms and in a way, I kind of boil it down to really one message, which is the, the chicken message, right? The chicken trying to be a flamingo. That is, in other ways, if you want to appear normal, to be a part of the group, just do like this chicken does in this group of flamingos. Get on your uh, crouches, um, put on false legs, so we'll pretend, uh, fake it, and, and then you eventually make it. So, so even though you disagree with this, even though other people uh, either, even though you think that women should work outside of the household, that is, you're a chicken, 
and you think everyone else is a flamingo, that is, you think everyone else doesn't want these women to work outside of the household, you do what the others do. It's kind of, it's really the, um, almost a crowd effect or, uh, or uh, a sheep factor, if you like. And, and there is tons of evidence and I can provide you very funny experiments and natural experiments as well. The experiments, uh, examples of social norms. So what are social norms actually? So social norms are these unwritten rules about what is acceptable in a given group or society. Um, so norms that you might be familiar with are exchange Christmas gifts with family members. So when it's Christmas, you exchange family members. Or if you're in the US, you need to leave a tip to the waiter. Interesting, if you're in Japan and you leave a tip to the waiter, that's considered insulting. So obviously social norms, these rules vary by context. The same norms that you will have in Egypt, you are not going to have in the UK. Uh, offer water to a visitor. Um, in, I lived for many, many years in Senegal, and in Senegal there is a norm that when someone walks in your house and you're eating, you need to invite them to eat with you. Otherwise it's considered very, ro very rude. And these norms are often maintained by positive and negative sanctions. This is not the only mechanism through which norms are maintained, but it's one of the most referenced. And sanctions are essentially what you imagine is going to happen if you comply or don't comply with the norm. Say again, in the example I just gave, uh, say that you, don't, you, don't, you come to Christmas and you don't have gifts for your, for your family, well, you think, well, it's, it's going, I'm going to be gossiped about or next year I'm not going to receive any gifts, and so on and so forth. Um, so when it get, comes to the theory, and this is kind of the only, oh well, social norms have important positive roles, actually, before I get into that. Uh, they help us work together. We are the only species that is capable of working, well, is us and the fire ants, actually. But apart from the fire ants, we are the only animal species who can work together with large groups of people, large group of members. Um, and then also when you comply with social norms, you actually feel better. So feeling part of the group is correlated with normal blood pressure, with physical and mental health. Um, so nobody really wants to not be part of the group. So, so maybe let's stop here for a second before we get into the more practical stuff. And Nisha, do you have another poll for us? Yes. So the poll that Nisha is going to pull up builds on this fact, right? That we know that complying with social norm has a positive effect. Um, okay, you should see it now. Thank you. So, so she will, she's, she, what we are asking you is, do you agree or disagree with the following statement? Changing social norms can lead to the ostracization of those who don't comply. So we shouldn't change norms. Because, because it's better to keep a po the positive effects of a certain status quo, rather than then, if we change them, then we, we put some people at risk. And I can't see results, Nisha, so you, you tell me when we have some. Okay, there. Oh. You should and most people disagree. Well, that's very interesting. So, so we'll get back to that in a minute. So you, most, the 28 people who voted, and two agreed, but 28 people said, uh, well, no, we need, we need to expose people. And we will get to that in the discussion section, but please do bear it in mind. So one working definition of social norms is that norms are people's beliefs. People's beliefs about two things in particular. One, what, so if I'm referring to each one of you, so imagine you will have some beliefs about what people around you do, right? At the office, they will wear in a certain way, they will say hi in a certain way. When you meet someone, they will shake your hands. This, this first type of norm is often called and referred to as descriptive norms or um, empirical expectations. And then you will have um, another type of norms, in, uh, which is the belief about what people in, in your group approve uh, and disapprove of. So you might believe that everyone comes wearing a shirt. Uh, and you might also believe that people disapprove if you come to work wearing a t-shirt. So based on these two beliefs, you decide to wear a shirt as well. So just to sediment the concept of social norms, 
another important piece is that social norms are not personal attitudes. And what do I mean by that? Well, let me tell you the stories of my niece. So we're getting ready for my um, uh, for, for a family member's wedding and she comes down stairs and she's dressed like this, right? So she, she's dressed like a, one, um, like a crazy vampire for the wedding. And that's really the way she wanted to come. But then my brother told her, oh, no, no, you cannot come that way. You don't know how our grandfather is going to react and all the family. They're going to consider you as being stupid and me as being a bad father. And so in the end, she put on a more appropriate uh, dress. She wasn't happy. Her attitude was to dress like a vampire. She's very young. She's three years old. But she had to do it. She had to comply with the norm. So sometimes we want to do something. And, and we trump our own desire to comply with the norm. And here's an example. I'd like to smoke, but I have to do it to look cool. I wouldn't like to drink that much, but you have to fit in, so I do it. Um, or this one is also an interesting one. I'd like to report the teacher that he's hitting the child, but nobody does it, and I think others will stop talking to me. Or an example could be, I'm a woman, I'd like to go and, and, and work outside. I, I, I'm educated, I'd like to work outside and find a job, but I'm worried about what my neighbors will say. I'm worried about what they will say to my husband, and in turn, my husband might, might hit me. We actually did find exactly this dynamic when we look in Nigeria at norms against uh, working for women working outside of the household. And what we found is that in those places where only a few women worked outside of the household, they were exposed to greater domestic violence. When instead most of the, the village population worked already outside of the household, most of the female population, then these women were at much lower risk of domestic violence. So you see, we found a norm that women who work outside of the household are threatening the, the status quo, and that puts pressure on the husband who then in turn um, perpetrated domestic violence. Now, I just told you that some people may want to do something, but the norm may want to do something positive, but the norm might expose them to harm. Uh, so for instance, I wouldn't like to drink, but my friends drink, so I do too. The opposite can also be true. Um, so the opposite might be, I would like to drink, but my friends don't drink. So there is a tendency in norms work to focus on this relation between the attitude and the norm. And I just want to make you mindful of the fact that actually people not only might think that they don't want, they, 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 they want to drink uh, because it's the, what, that's what they want to do, but they also think that's what their friends want them to do. Or in case of financial inclusion, uh, a woman might not only think that she will be disapproved to work outside of the household, she also herself doesn't want to work outside of the household. So this is to say that norms and attitudes have complex relations and understanding these attitudes have, have, has very important implications for interventions. If most people have a positive attitude, so if most people think that yes, women sh uh, should work outside of the household, but they are worried about what others will say, then an intervention should just um, uncover this um, misalignment between people's own attitudes and what they believe others want to do. Uh, so essentially, just to repeat that again, if everyone in a given village is okay with women working outside of the household, but they just never talked about it and they think that others will disapprove, then an intervention should just put them in touch and uncover the misperception. So this relation, we can go on this relation a little bit more, uh, over this relation a little bit more uh, in case that we need to clarify. And this is just on the evidence of social norms and what they sustain. We know they sustain alcohol use, substance abuse, condom use, bullying, domestic violence, corporal punishment of children, men's readiness to ask for help. And I've talked to the men in the, in, in the webinar. You might have, uh, if you grew up uh, in the 70s and 80s, we were kind of taught in Italy at least that you're not supposed to reach out for help. You're supposed to be the, the one that gives help, not the one that receives it, or access to education. And, and in low and middle income countries, people have mostly focused on female genital on norms, sustaining female genital cutting, child marriage, family planning, domestic violence, and open defecation. But there is a big movement about norms and uh, financial inclusions on the one hand, 
and norms or, and corruption. Uh, there is also a group of people who studied social norms and, and the economy. And they, obviously social norms started as a, as, as a way of facilitating interaction in the market. So obviously, if you want to sell peanuts, if you're a woman who wants to sell peanuts, one norm that you need to know very well is how much do peanuts go for? That is, in a way, you are thinking of which price will be approved of and which price will be disapproved of. Another norm you have to think, if you're a woman going to the market, is which, what, what can I sell as a woman? As a woman, maybe I cannot sell knives because that's what men sell. But as a woman, I can sell clothing. And then another, war, another norm might be which part of the, the market am I allowed into? Uh, and finally, another norm might be um, am I allowed to go and, and to go to, 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 to uh, do I have the mobility to go to the market? Am I allowed to go to the market? Will people and my neighbors approve of me if I, they saw me walking around alone going to the market? I'll, um, I'll just mention this very quickly. Norms have different strength in, and they're very different in the city and in like this complex circle here and in small villages. And why is that? Well, think about it. If you come from a small village, then your husband and your cousins, are also your neighbors, are also your business partners, they're also the people who play with your children. They might be the teachers of your children. They might be the people that you spend time with. So all these roles overlap. And so in a way, if you cheat your business partners, then your family members might not be there for you anymore. You might not have a friend anymore. So all these roles overlap, which is why you're much more attentive to, what, to, to try and get people's approvals. In a complex city, your business partner might not be the person that you buy peanuts from and might not be the person that, that uh, teaches your children and so on and so forth. So in a way, there is more freedom. I will skip through these. Uh, these are nice experiments, but, but the, the, the juice, because I want to get to the discussion, but the juice in here is that sometimes norms apply in a very small group, right? So think about um, a norm uh, in a small village that a woman is worried about or, or a woman might think what might be anticipating what uh, the people in her narrow family will think about her right or another example is what some of you might anticipate uh, as they go to work so not many of you would go to work wearing a swimming suit because because you're thinking particularly of my boss my colleague the person um, on the ground floor and that's kind of this group over here, as in the case of this adolescent who's trying to decide whether she should smoke or not. But other norms are just that out there in the ethos of a society. So we might open the door to, to a, an old person or a disabled person, not because I, we anticipate rewards from that specific person. We don't know them, we might never see them again, but that's just what people do. So in the case of women's financial inclusion, you might need to work with both. On the one hand, connecting people together in small groups. On the other hand, challenging uh, statewide rules and, and understandings of what women are and should be allowed to do. Uh, so let me give you three final points before I conclude. The first is that not all norms are equal. Uh, this is a study in, uh, done in swimming pools. So, so even though a norm exists that you're not supposed to do let go of your urine in a swimming pool well then a re this research found that actually a lot of people do it why is it well it's because there is there's no way of knowing who's doing complying or not with the norm um, so you cannot buy a dying substance but you can buy a sign that says that pretends that there is a dying substance in the in the swimming pool why is that because people are trying to make the behavior more detectable. So for behaviors that are not detectable, then the norm might not be very strong. So if you take domestic violence, even though this, this one man knows that he's not supposed to hit his wife, but if this man thinks that, well, nobody's ever going to know about it anyway, then even if there is a norm against domestic violence, that norm doesn't have much strength. Uh, in the case of women's financial inclusion, if the woman has to walk outside of the house of the village and she's seen by many doing so, 
well, then maybe the norm might indeed be very strong because people will know whether this woman is allowed to leave the household or not. And we have a case on child marriage that I could uh, uh, present to you if you're interested to hear more about this, but I will skip through it. So essentially here, the, con this, the main concept of this nice slide is that some norms have a stronger influence, some norms have a weaker influence. Um, and, and, under and there are ways of understanding which norms is influencing which behavior. The second point is that norms bundle in universes. So let me give you an example from domestic violence. Um, we asked Indian women, uh, would you talk about domestic violence? And they said, no, I cannot talk about domestic violence because you know, no, no women do. All women in this community pretend that their relationships, their relationships are perfect. And, and if I talk to them to domestic violence, so you, you see, this is kind of the, the first type of belief, that's what people do. And then they anticipated also beliefs of the second type. They would tell me, oh, it's your fault. You can manage your man. This is why he's hitting you. Similarly, the men gave us similar statements. So, so our conclusion from this finding is that sometimes there is one norm for one behavior. And this is the case of female genital cutting. And it might be the case for women financial inclusion. So say, for instance, the behavior is women don't work outside of the household. And that's because there is a norm that women are not supposed to work outside of the household. But together with this direct norm, which you see is essentially just the behavior, is, the, is what people are, whether people are supposed to engage in that behavior or not. There is also a universe of norms. So let me still give you, well, this comes from domestic violence. And um, so this is norms of family honor. We're not supposed to talk about what happens in the family. Norms of family privacy, as a neighbor, I'm not supposed to go into what happens in the family, and there is a norm of tolerance of violence. As a woman, I'm supposed to tolerate violence. So you see, in this case, the behavior is not normative. So a man is hitting his wife, not because he believes that he's supposed to do so, not because he believes that that way he'll be approved. So there is no norm mimicking the behavior. But there is a universe of norms allowing that behavior to happen. So again, in the case of women's financial inclusion, even if there is no norm that women are not supposed to work outside of the household, so in theory, women could work outside of the household, but maybe there is a norm that women are not supposed to walk outside of the village alone. Maybe there is a norm that women are not supposed to uh, go and, uh, uh, and generate revenue. Women are not supposed to move, uh, go to the market without their husband, and so on and so forth. And the last, um, point that I have for you is that, as, as some of you mentioned already, and this is as, as, um, as maybe just um, skip through the slides and get to this, which is the, the main point, is that you cannot look at norms alone as factors, but, but they intersect with other factors. So this is kind of an evolution of the ecological framework that we, um, that we created. And this, what this is saying is, as you look at laws and policies, or that is institutional factors, as you look at uh, aspirations, knowledge, skills, education, that is individual factors, as you look at social factors, such as uh, availability of models, social support, the family structure, the presence of positive deviance. And finally, as you look at material factors, such as availability of services, infrastructures, etc., etc., you need to look at you need to look at how these factors intersect. And is that the intersection between these factors that uh, that norms exist and operate. So you might have a law that women are allowed by law to, to seek employment, and these women might be uh, herself know about the law, but, uh, but if the police officers, they uh, are not ready to protect women who are, um, uh, uh, who are beaten up because they go to the market, because the police officers themselves think that that's not a, a woman's place, then here at the intersection between the law and what women and the police officers think, you have an opportunity to operate, that is to work. So what are the key messages of the presentation? The key messages is the key messages are one, social norms are beliefs about what others do and approve of. Two, they are different from personal attitudes. Remember the story of Denise. But these two norms and attitudes can be aligned or misaligned. And when they are misaligned, you have a clear opportunity for intervention. You need to just to uncover this misalignment. When you are aligned, when then first you need to create a core group of people who will lead the change. The fourth point is that not all norms are equal. 
Some are more powerful, some are less powerful. The fifth point is that norms can have direct or indirect influence. Remember the case of um, there not being a norm that women are, uh, shouldn't work outside of the household, that would be fine, but there is a norm against women's mobility. And the last factor, the last key message is that norm play, uh, affects several factors on different domains in the ecological frameworks. And, and really you need to understand how norms intersect with other factors in designing effective interventions. So the, I understand this is a lot to take in and it's just an introduction, but I hope it serves you well uh, as you start to think about integrating social norms in your work. Okay, uh, thank you, Ben. Um, so we will take questions from um, the audience. You can type your questions into the chat or the, the Q&A. Um, I don't see anything. Um, so maybe as, as people are kind of thinking about their questions, um, Ben, I wanted to ask one question about, you know, there's this assumption often that norms are, are negative. Um, but that doesn't always have to be the case. So are there examples of positive norms that should be fostered also? Yeah, that's actually, thank you for asking that question. Uh, it was an important omission on my end. Yeah, absolutely. We, I have to say in international development, we have a tendency to, to see problems in people's cultures, but they are also sources of solution. So as an example, when I worked on female genital cutting in West Africa, there was, yes, a norm that um, girls were supposed to be cut, but there was also a mess um, norm that parents were supposed to do the best for their children. So the intervention I work with leveraged this positive norm, parents are supposed to be the best for their children, and changed the meaning of what best was. It took three years, but then in the end, parents were uh, going around, uh, knocking at each other's door saying, did you take your children to vaccinate? Did you send your children to school? So, so, so they leverage and foster this positive norm of taking care for their children. Okay, great. Um, so we have a suggestion to please provide examples of key messages in financial inclusion. So the, your summary key messages uh, relating that to specific examples in financial inclusion and maybe, um, yeah. yeah, do you want yeah. to go? Yeah, sure, I'll take this. Break. So the first case would be social norms are beliefs about uh, what others do and approve of. For instance, uh, social norms could be the belief about what, whether other women work outside of the household or not. That would be the first type of norm. And the second time it would be uh, whether um, people approve or disapprove of women who work outside of the household, right? Yeah. That they're different from personal attitudes. So even though in a house, even though, even though men and women independently might look positively at, the, at women who work outside of the household, they might believe that everyone else instead looks at them negatively. So even though a man or a woman might hold a positive attitude from, for uh, uh, a woman working in, in, for paid employment, they might believe that if a woman does so, they will be she will be disapproved. And attitude can be aligned or misaligned, and I think I explained this. And then not all, not all norms are equal. So um, as in, in, this, in the very urbanized city, a norm against women in the household might not count as much as in a small village because in the urbanized city, maybe you emigrated and your family emigrated. So even though your family of origin would disapprove of you working for, for money, nobody in the city knows it. And, and so nobody knows what you're doing. So that norm is not very strong. Um, and then in the sixth case, norms can affect factors on several domains. Yeah, so there might be a norm against women working outside of the household, uh, and that intersects with, um, might intersect with um, other norms of uh, caretaking or um, against norms of um, 
men's against laws that uh, that intersect with laws against uh, women possessing land, for mm -hmm. instance. So that, um, well, I can go actually in, in, in details, but I see, I see that the, 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 the chat mm -hmm. box is getting crowded, so I'll stop there for a second. Sure. Um, so sort of uh, picking up on that, uh, there's a question around what kind of local partners do people work with to shift norms? For example, in the instance of the policeman who didn't, doesn't interfere in case of domestic violence, how do you identify the influencer of the police? In financial inclusion programming, we're used to working with financial service providers. Should we continue trying to influence them? Is, is that the appropriate point of intervention or should we be looking at other actors? I think probably the, the answer to, to this question is uh, contextual. So yeah. uh, I guess financial service providers would be the perfect actors in certain contexts. One thing that we know from social norms, um, and this can speak also maybe to the second, to the following point about the, chain, the examples of change approaches, but something we know about social norms is that if you have a strong norm that is a big roadblock to you achieving change, then you need to work with the entire network. So you can't just work with women individually and, and then maybe with their husbands individually and then with the, the, the financial service providers individually. And then this does, and then for some, then they say, yeah, well, we understand that, but we can't do it. You need to kind of put them together and show that there is a movement for change that is happening, that women are already working outside of the household in this village, or that people are ready for them working outside of the village, so that the group is changing and the group is shifting. Uh, and, and if you operate individually with, with, with people, that you might not create the same um, uh, effect. Okay, great. Um, uh, there's a question around how, uh, how long does it take to effectively change harmful norms for better ones? Uh, this is at the background that norms are influenced by complex beliefs, attitudes, macro policies. What's a rule of thumb, if any, for duration of a program that's effective? Because a lot of us have to think in terms of program cycles or, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, I guess they, um, again, I'm sorry to say, but it really depends. So my colleague, Upta, she worked uh, on a project um, on financial, uh, sorry, on child marriage in, in India. And they, they were in, in this kind of situation, right? Where, let me put it up. Where people had all these positive attitudes but they were in, so when this happens at scale is called pluralistic ignorance which is which is a complex term that means essentially mm -hmm. they all want to do the good thing and they think that everyone else wants to do the bad thing and in that case they got rid of child marriage in two weeks because everyone if you think about it I, you know you might have never talked to your family about giving christmas gifts or whatever the similar norm is in, in, in your culture. Um, and at the end of December, I'm always broke. If we all, and I never have money, if, we, if my family and I talked about it, and if everyone was against this, then it could be changed in one minute. Instead, when you are in other situations, such as this one, then norms, particularly gender norms, might be very deep-seated and might take time. Um, they, the programs that I've seen working take, these are, might take take from one to three from one to five years uh, depending on the context so usually i'm very skeptical of six week programs that uh, provide a couple of trainings okay great um moving on um so this is there's a question when it comes to norms uh, related to women's economic empowerment uh, there's the issue of unpaid care work and you know norms where men um, feel threatened if women are economically active so um ideas around how to change those um if you have examples otherwise um this is something we're going to focus on in the e-discussion some um, and I'm happy to also share some thoughts on that. One thing that uh, I think we are not doing as well, as when I say we, I mean people working on gender equality, is to kind of break the dichotomies of every woman being a victim and every man being, or every woman being a solution, every woman being a solution and every man being a problem. 
And I think in a way the social norms approach allows us to understand um, the way in which networks operate. So in a way, um, you know, when what we found in India is that the men who were kind of putting pressure on women, they themselves were under the pressure of the, uh, their parents. And, and interestingly, very often it was their mothers. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what we know about changing norms, again, is um, my advice is to start, when you want to change a norm, what we found is to start with those who are still complying with the harmful norm, but they are the radiator to change. Because that, so you will have in a village, you will always, in, in any context, I say a village because I lived in a rural village in Senegal for seven years, so that's my benchmark. But, but in any context, you will have some people who are already doing the positive thing, some people who are very well entrenched in the negative, and, and some people are kind of in the middle and they're ready to shift. And, and, and working with those people, making them agents of change, can create the critical mass you need to pull the, 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 the group of the most resistance to, to change. And I know, I mean, these, these are questions that take weeks to, to tackle, so I'm just giving a flavor. Great, yeah. Um, and uh, there was a question sort of, I think you've already answered it, which is what are the most effective strategies for changing norms? So you, you talked about this, you know, finding people who are already at the edge of change, providing information. Is there anything else you'd like to say, like if you had to pick three things that probably work best? Yeah, I, I prefer to do, um, my, my work focuses on people-led changes. Um, so creating, which essentially is creating civil movements. I don't particularly like media campaigns, okay. um, especially in very diversified contexts because I think the jury is out on their effectiveness. Uh, but of course, creating, changing models in films, that can be effective. But I think, I think we do need to work at co a community level. Um, and, and to do so, we need, we need to, create, one, create motivation to change. And, and I can tell a model to do so later by email. I can send papers of how you do this. One create, so one, create motivation to change. Two, help people enact action, visible action of change. And three, publicize, vis the, increase the visibility of, of their actions and help the group expand to pull in mo motivator, motivated others who did not initially participate in your intervention. Okay, that's helpful. Um, so, you know, you, you talked a little bit about, you know, there's indirect norms and direct norms that are often at play and they, have diff they might have different st strengths. So when we're working in, you know, um, complex situations where there's like layered norms, so to speak, that might be at play, how do you, is there a way to think about where to start? Um, what would be a good starting point? Uh, you mean, so is this question you think about mult, uh, multiple layers as in multiple norms? norms yeah, which have differing uh, levels of influence. Yeah, it's a very good question. I Usually I think there are some norms that kind of, I call them cornerstone norms because they held in place much of the structure. Um, we don't yet have evidence whether we should work on the cornerstone norms and then the wall will crumble or we should kind of erode the, easy, the, 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 the low hanging fruit or the, 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 the top bricks and then this will leak down to the fundamentals, foundation of the, of the house. Um, but what, <clears throat> what I know is that usually if you ask people, people will tell you. So one day I went in uh, with a colleague, Mike Wessels, from Colombia and he wanted to work on um, sexual harassment and the community said, no, 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 let's work on educa girls' education. And by working on girls' education, they got rid of sexual harassment. So sexual harassment would have been a, a no-go topic, mm -hmm. but by working on, on, on girls' education, then they, they put lies in the streets and then they, that eventually generated change in norms around mm -hmm. the acceptability of sexual harassment. So, so I think people usually know their context and they can help. Okay. Um, 
So we have an interesting question around uh, when we observe all or most of the members of a community doing the same thing, how do we find out whether it is because there's a norm in operation or is it, you know, and, and the sort of the strength of that norm also? Yeah, so that's a, me so it's two questions in there. One is the measurement question and the other one, what do you do when you have no yeah. allies to begin with? And and the measurement question, the baseline, and so there are both um, qualitative and quantitative methods that you can enact. And the qualitative are usually cheaper, uh, mm -hmm. and they, and that's where I, I usually what I usually start with. And the learning collaborative on social norms that I steer together with others, uh, and that is based at Georgetown University, has published a set of diagnostic tools for diagnosing social norms, and there is also a report that we published in 2017 on measuring social norms. And I'm more than happy to share that. And so there are methods in the literature that allow, simple methods, uh, that allow you to integrate questions or, or to investigate qualitatively social norms. When you have, so that's on the measurement side. On the intervention side, when essentially you have no allies, then one thing that works is you start with a core group and you begin facilitating discussions that, that help people identify what they themselves think to be problematic in their context. Um, I'm also a firm believer that you cannot make people do what they don't want to do. And external incentives will work for a while, but the minute external incentives stop, uh, then the, the, the incentivized behavior stops. So generally speaking, I think that it's better to invest longer and develop internal motivation uh, than kind of renounce or, or looking for, look for quick fixes. Great, thanks. Um, we'll share the resources that Ben mentioned, which came out of the Learning Collaborative, and they're not all now housed on Align, which is a platform for uh, resources on gender norms. Um, ben, there's a request to go over some of the experiments. So if, if we could pick one and go over it. Yeah, yeah, this one is actually very cool. This one is my colleague, um, uh, Case Kaiser. Um, and we're doing similar experiments now in low-income in, in low -income countries. But so what he's done here, he was in the net. So he wanted to know if people follow the crowd or people followed those most similar to them. So what he did is, you know, in, in the Netherlands, there is a norm that you're supposed to smoke inside the smoking area at the train station. And in the smoking area, mm, uh, you to reach it you need to cross the train bank so he said okay let's try to challenge this norm so in the middle he puts some of his friends some of his confederates research staff smoking and so what what my colleague wanted to see is what will people do if they get out here from the right side they cross the bank they see these people smoking Will they say, oh, well, if they're smoking, I will smoke too? Or will they continue to the smoking area where you're supposed to go? And what he finds is that, yes, when there is all these people, then you have more people who stop as well. So people do follow the crowd. But then he dressed these people up as gods. So, you know, long beard, piercings, black shirts and black trousers with signs of skulls. And what he finds in this case is that when people are dressed as gods, actually this norm has the opposite effect. Uh, so more people decide to go to the smoking area because they don't want to be associated with the gods. So this is important for intervention because if, if you do, for instance, an intervention on financial inclusion in, in Senegal and you do a campaign in the wall of language, which is indeed the language that is the most spoken, the people where I lived, the Fulani people uh, in the village, they actually felt culturally aggressed by the Wolof culture. So even though they speak Wolof, they can, they can understand Wolof, but if they saw a, an intervention in Wolof, they would think, oh, there you go, we don't want to be associated with the Wolof, so we will make sure that our women stay well at home because it's the, it's the wall of women who go out and work outside of the household. So, so this is why sometimes I think that campaign can have this kind of boomerang effect.
And since there is some silence, I'll just give another example, of, another just uh, caveat is that if we share the high, the high prevalence of a negative behavior, we might actually be reinforcing the negative norm. So if we want to shock and sensitize the general population and we create communication campaigns such as nine women out of 10 stay home and, and don't have a job, uh, then we might actually create the belief that, oh, nobody's working outside of the household, so I shouldn't either. So while these numbers are very important for policy reasons, advocacy reasons, lobbying, political lobbying, um, just creating posters with these shocking statistics for the general population might actually have a boomerang effect. And this has been tested in another experiment. Um, so yeah, so just be careful. Okay, great. Um, and we had a comment and a sort of question saying the example was very relevant to financial inclusion. And, you know, but how do we make sure we understand all the nuances in, in this context? Um, yeah, that's very important. I think, I think that's why formative research is so, uh, is, is so critical. I now don't work anymore on grants that do not have an inception phase that allow you to understand what's going on. And sometimes donors just want, just give you one month of inception phase and then you need to do the baseline and then you're, you already need to have decided the campaign or whatever you're doing and where you do it. And I think instead, sometimes we need to sl we need to slow down so that our wheels don't spin and uh, slow down to, to move better and slow down to go faster, really. Yeah, um, and the, sort of related to that was the question, so do you think, based on what you know of most development interventions, specifically economic development, do you think we're equipped to incorporate these approaches more systematically or this is, it's a long way to go? Yeah, I mean, I could, I, I could talk about this for, for a long time and if people want to have lunch and they are happy to be in London and more than happy, I think we have a long way to go. And I think mostly we have a long way to go because I, very often we are very concerned with showing effect rather than generating effect. Showing effect will give us uh, resources, will save our jobs, um, will make, uh, will prove a certain theory. So academics, practitioners, NGOs, UN, I think the, 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 as the individual people who are ready to risk their jobs and their mortgage and, you know, in, in the capitalist system where we work, in the end, you must be very concerned about and protect your own economic and financial situation, which is understandable. I mean, it's not a critique to the pe to people themselves, it's a critique to the system. So in the end, in the end, we lack what we need, which is f uh, finan financing interventions that might take longer, that might not generate outcomes right now, but they rather build into a stream of work or intervention that don't start right away, but they take a year to fully understand the, the context and the situations or interventions that don't overpromise saying we will change norms in an entire country with a hundred thousand dollars and then what they do is they do a village in the north and a village in the south but rather they use they get a million dollars and they only work in one department because realistically that's what you can do and i think i think we are i think i think there, there is a long way to go okay um so we have a few minutes left and um i think we've touched on most of the, the main questions that relate to your presentation. I know there's a, there was um, an ask for some examples that are more specifically financial inclusion related. And I think what I want to do is point everyone to the e-discussion that we have starting after this webinar, where the whole goal is to start looking at within our community in financial inclusion and women's economic empowerment, where, what are we seeing in terms of potential strategies, tools, examples of norms change work? So, so stay tuned for that. Um, and you know, we'll be following up with information on that. Um, there is um, one sort of question related to what you talked about just now around the ethics of social norm change. 
particularly when it relates to changing behavior according to a Western normative lens. Uh, and I know we've talked a little bit about this. Yeah, and thank you. That's a, an excellent question. I actually teach with others global health ethics. So there is a huge question in here, which is who has the mandate and who, who takes responsibility and where is the accountability in the process for change? And I think, I think um, not only that's an excellent question, but, and it's a very long conversation, but in a way, I worry when people say we want to change social norms. I kind of prefer to say we want to facilitate changing social norms, working with people and uh, helping civil movements to, to, to move forward, but also taking accountability for um, the negative consequences. And, and the question that we asked at the very beginning is, you know, you might, if you create a norm that <clears throat> financial inclusion is, is positive, that women are supposed to work outside of the household, well, then you might generate situations in which the women who don't work outside of the household, they're considered bad. What's wrong with you? Why don't you have a job, right? Which is what happens with men today. Men in Italy, if, if you say, I, I must stay home dead, then people go like, what, what, why? What's wrong with you? So that's, and then not only, but then you also need to take accountability for the fact that essentially then who's taking care of the children. And if you have the men working full time, the woman working full time, usually it's just a more vulnerable woman who will come and work for, for a little sum of money to work. So, so I guess that the ethics are very complex and, and we could talk very deeply for hours about that. But, but if it's something that you want to discuss later on, uh, I'd love to have a Skype particularly about that. Great, thank you. And um, Ben, I'm gonna ask you to stop sharing your screen so I can share mine. Oops. Okay, so just to wrap up everyone, we, um, I have a list of your questions and we hope that we can answer some of them over the course of the next three days as we launch into our um, online uh, discussion on how do social norms impact women's financial inclusion and how can they be shifted. I put a link for the, the, the D groups page uh, where we are hosting the discussion. Once you sign up, you can um, follow the discussion from your email inbox. Um, we have a really exciting agenda and I'll put the link to the agenda in the chat box as well. Um, over the course of these three days, we have nine different technical moderators who are taking turns and will be sharing some of their examples, but also responding to your questions. And also it's an opportunity for you to share your own work and experiences and examples, as well as all the other questions you have in, in your work related to, uh, you know, promoting women's financial inclusion and how, um, we can address this issue of social norms as, as which is often a barrier for women's financial inclusion. So um, we hope you'll, you'll definitely sign up for that if you haven't already. And uh, Ben, I wanna thank you again for your time. And uh, we will be discussing the, the question around ethics of norms change as a part of this e-discussion, but I think, yes, it is a larger conversation and then we'll hopefully follow that up later in, in, um, in a webinar as well. Thank you very much, it was my pleasure and I, I look forward to anyone who wants to continue the conversation. Okay, thank you everyone for your time and, um, and we'll follow up with resources and uh, also the information on how to join the discussion and um, how to stay tuned with this conversation. Thank you for your time.